and I know sometimes you guys are like, oh, enough Kardashians, but I'm sorry. They're just an endless fountain of lessons that we can all learn, especially Courtney, who recently announced via a Vogue Arabia interview that she has officially quit keeping up with the Kardashians. I'm going to break down what she said, what I think. Sorry, there's like a bug in here. You live out in the country and you leave your doors open and it's like nature gets in. Weird. I'm going to break down what I think is going on behind the scenes with her, why she would prefer to be around her children instead of her sisters, and we're going to talk about how to branch away from your family, stand up for yourself, and make decisions that maybe not everyone agrees with. I'll get all into it, but first, just want to remind you guys to follow me on Instagram. You guys suggested this topic, and then you voted on the topic. I love it when you weigh in, so head over to ShallonXO on Insta. Also, if you would like a video shout out from me, question answer personally, a birthday wish, find me on Cameo at ShallonXL and follow my sexy new platform, InfStream. It's a really cool ad-free subscription platform. It's two bucks a month. And the reason I'm on there is so we can talk about sexy stuff. There is a kissing tutorial because yes, there is a formula for the perfect kiss. I also have a hand job tutorial up there. Like I know you think like hand jobs. Oh, trust me, girl. I've got the goods. That's up there right now. And then next week we're going to be doing a Low job tutorial. So I'm taking you through all the sexy stuff that YouTube won't let us talk about, but I will. So let's talk Courtney, okay? So she gave yeah an interview to Vogue Arabia about why she's quitting the show, and we're gonna read her quote, and I'm gonna do it in her voice. I have been filming the show nonstop for 14 years. I was feeling unfulfilled and it became a toxic environment for me to continue to have it occupy as much of my life as it was. Privacy is something I have come to value and finding that balance of private moments with being on a reality show is hard. People have this misconception that I don't want to work, which isn't true. I am following my happiness and putting my energy into what makes me happy. She then went on and on about how she loves to be around her kids. She just wants to spend more time around her kids. It's like, yeah, girl, most most moms do. Most moms do, but they do have to go to work. And it's funny. She's like, people think I don't want to work. Hmm. It's not that I don't think Courtney wants to work. I don't think she wants to work on something like successful. Don't even come at me with push. Do you guys, do you guys, speaking of like subscription things, do you guys subscribe to push? Or do you go to the website? I mean, is it is it free? I don't even know. I don't, and I don't think it's, it can't be that big of a moneymaker. And so many of you guys, when you suggested this topic, it was like, poosh ain't goop. Not the same. You're not Gwyneth Paltrow. Like some of her articles are like, okay. I think I like signed up once to like read something about something. And I was just like, this is so whatever. It's just this is like Refinery29 that I could get for free. This is, or like Brit & Co or something like that. Just, okay. We've done videos on Courtney before, and we have mixed feelings here with Courtney here in the Chalantourage, because on one hand, I think she is a confidence queen, and I look up to her a lot because of her attitude. She is unbothered, unembarrassed, and untakeable with your bullshit. Like, guys love her because she's a bitch, and I love her because she's like 40, and she dates like 22-year-olds. I'm like, girl, yeah, one day when I get there, I'm going to be doing the same thing sooner rather than later, but... I love it because she's just, she is her truth and she lives it. But we know that there's a lot of downside to Courtney. I think she can be a huge bully and I think she can embody the victim narrative. We've said like when she would get, remember she got in that like fist fight with Kim on Keeping Up With The Kardashians? It felt like she was baiting Kim and she picks fights with her sister so that she can have like power over them to either be the wounded victim or to like make fun of them when they're crying. Like she's laughing when they're crying or when when Chloe's like, why do you call me a pussy? Like, don't don't do that. And she's like, sorry, you don't get humor. She's like, I get humor fine. I don't get insults. And that's an insult. It's not a joke. It's an insult. And the person you're directing it to has the right to decide which it is. And she's like, Sorry, you suck so badly. And it's just like this, there's a, there's a lot of duality with Courtney, as there is with all of us. And we've talked before about her obsession with her children. And it's funny that she's like, I'm a mom, I'm a busy mom. And both Chloe and Kim are like, <laughs> we're all moms, dude. Like, you've got three kids. I've got four, man. Like, I've got a, a daughter and a crazy baby daddy. It's like, we're all busy, you know? And I hate that. <sighs> 
I love my mom friends, but I don't have a lot of them because of attitudes like that, where it's like, oh, you have a work event? Mm, I have a t-ball game. It's like, okay, you're busy. I'm busy. We're all busy. One schedule isn't more important or more valid than the other person's schedule. I'm making time for you. If you can't make time for me, don't blame it on your kids, dude. Just blame it on you. So you're not into it. And finally, that's kind of what Courtney's doing. She's like, I'm just not into it. It's a toxic environment. It was a toxic environment because I think Courtney made it a toxic environment. When she's spiky and snippy and when she's baiting people, they're going to snap back at her. And then she gets to play the victim. It's like they're all ganging up on me. Who does she prefer to be around? Her children. Why? She's got power over them. She can be a little tyrant in her own fight. She's a good mom, for sure, and she loves her kids. I don't think she's a mean mom, but she is all powerful in that environment. And a lot of single parents can be like that. I mean, she's like, ugh, basically a single mom. You know, I don't know, Scott's just like, he's there. He like keeps him from lighting the house on fire. I don't know. But she has felt historically like a single mom because Scott was so out of control that it was like, she can do whatever she wants and there nothing Scott would ever do is going to trump that. Like, she could be as out of control as she wanted to be. Wait, she wasn't, but she could, because what is Scott going to say? You're acting crazy, you're being a bad mom? Oh, let me tell you some things. She had power. And a lot of single parents, I mean, they're doing the best they can. I was raised by a single mom, you know, and I know a lot of single moms. It's so hard, but they get used to being in control. They get used to their loving tyranny, you know? And it's very hard to, first of all, watch your kids grow up and have agency of their own. They're like, we're not doing that, mom. And it's like, Ugh, excuse me. And it's very hard to be in environments where you aren't the boss. And given the dynamics with her and her sisters, she's not, and she's never going to be. She's not the money maker. She doesn't have a thing of her own. Kendall's a model. Kylie has the makeup. Kim has, I mean, a million different things. The clothing line, the makeup, law. Chloe has her workout thing and her show Revenge Body. And Courtney has poosh. Come on. And so people have said for so long, it's like, okay, if she's so into her kids, why doesn't she make a business about kids? She could have like organic baby food or I don't know what a kid's like. Cheerios? Frozen? I don't know, man. But she does. And it's weird that she never really found her foothold. And her family reminded her of that all the time. And they made a compelling argument like you don't have anything else going on nothing that we don't also have like we have other shows we have other business lines we also have kids you don't have any of those things and yet you can't devote the proper and appropriate amount of energy to the only thing you do have which is this tv show how could that not build a lot of resentment from chloe and kim and i've always sort of been on like chloe and kim's team you know, I think that they're much more reasonable and I think that they are more oriented around peace in that relationship and just harmony going in filming. I'm sorry, my bangs are making me crazy. Going in filming and getting it done. But Courtney was oriented over victory. She was oriented around power and spite. And it's like, Ugh, girl, I love you. I love the way you are with dudes. I don't love the way you are with work. Don't love the way you are with your sisters. So she has made the decision to leave. And that is met with a lot of different opinions. I mean, this is opinion channel. I'm giving my opinion, not like anyone asked. Well, you guys DM me and ask me, so somebody asked. But no matter which side of this debate you're on, whether you think Courtney was a terrible employee in terms of keeping up with the Kardashians, or you think she had every right to leave, you kind of got a high fiver for going out on her own, you know? And sometimes you just hit a wall. And not sometimes, but all the time, you don't owe people an explanation about why. I've said in other videos, we've talked about like when to tell a guy you're a virgin or how to, should you tell him how many people you've slept with or should you tell them about past trauma? When we share things with people, it becomes, it's like we're handing over a paper for them to grade. We might as well give them a red pen to go with it because sharing something invites opinion. Again, look at what I did for a living. But they don't actually have the right to have an opinion on what you do. I don't have the right, the right to have an opinion on what Kylie and Chris and Courtney does, but I do anyway. And you know, you guys follow it. So here we are. But I don't have that right. And Courtney shouldn't live or die 
and make her decisions based on like what people think about her choices. I, for one, am sad to see Courtney go. She's funny. She wears like the same outfit every single time, like a white sort of cropped rib t-shirt and mom jeans. Not the most flattering, but I do like her and I do think she's funny. But I understand why she wanted to leave. And even if I didn't, who fucking cares? It's her decision. That's not what we're here to talk about. We're here to talk about how we can learn from this. I don't care how old you are. I don't care what decision you're considering making, branching away from the people we love and who are the main opinion leaders in our lives and standing up for ourselves is torture. It is absolute agony. It's awful, as my bangs are right now, but we have to do it. So we're gonna break down how to stand up for ourselves and branch away from what we've been told or maybe just a path that we're on when people are telling us, no. The first thing you need to do is really, really get comfortable about why you are making this decision. We're reactive creatures, right? We're overcorrectors. We date a guy who's quiet and studious. Next, we date the bad boy on the motorcycle. You know, like, you don't want me to run off and join the circus. I'm running off and joining the circus. I remember when I was 18 and I went away to college, my mom's like, there are two things you can't do. I was like, mm hmm And I was a very obedient, very good girl. She's like, you can't pierce anything and you can't do ecstasy. I was like, I won't. Literally the only two things I did because she told me I couldn't do those things. That was like my big form of rebellion. It was really not that bad. I was so, I had a pierced tongue. It was the trashiest thing in the world. It was the trashiest, garbage, raccooniest thing in the whole wide world. I hate it. But but that, that was my overcorrection, right? That was my rebellion. And it's, it's fine to make a decision that's an overcorrection if you realize that's what it is. You know, like I lived in New York City since I graduated college and I moved to Montana. And I acknowledge, and I did it in the video, I was like, I know that this is an overcorrection. You know what? I don't think this is my forever home. Maybe it is. I mean, I love it here. I'm super happy. It's not winter yet though. But I know, I know myself and I know that I'm an overcorrector and I have to swing to that other extreme to taste it before I'm like, okay, now we have data points on both sides. What's the happy medium here? And almost always I do that. But it took several large decisions and several big mistakes for me to realize that that's what's going on. But because I can now realize what's going on, I can explain it to people who have problems with it. Like my mother, she's like, I don't understand why when you were so focused on Nashville or Austin, why you're going so extreme to the middle of nowhere in Montana. And I, I said exactly what I said. I was like, it's an overcorrection. You know, I'm not buying a house here. Well, I, I did, but <laughs> at the time I was like, I'm not gonna do that, I did do that. But <laughs> I was like, you know what? I can always rent it, I can always sell it, whatever. I can undo these decisions, but I know myself and I know this is how I have to operate in order to come back into the happy middle. And she's like, okay, that's true. Cause I gave her other examples. I was like, I had to date this guy and then I had to date that guy. And then I settled on someone in the middle. She's like, all right, yes, I get that. I get that now. But because I was demonstrating self-awareness, she was more comfortable with that decision. But sometimes parents won't be comfortable. And we don't need them to be. Ugh, as I say, that tastes like acid coming out of my mouth because it feels so untrue. We are hardwired to please our parents. It's a survival instinct. Parents are not hardwired to please their, their children. I mean, they're not. You know, we see, I've said this before and we can do videos on this. Like whenever I see a fraught parent-child dynamic, and I rarely speak in absolutes, it is always the parent's fault. It is, it is. When you have a difficult child, they weren't getting something they needed. Stability, love, truth, whatever it was. Validation, it's parents who push away kids and fuck their kids up. I don't think it's, I mean, if you're like mentally healthy, you know, and not, anyway. So we are conditioned to love them. We're conditioned to make them happy. Again, it's a survival instinct. You don't make mama bird happy, she kicks your ass out of the nest, that's all she wrote. But our life's work is to figure out the line between what, what is right about keeping this person happy and what is going to make me happy. And again, that comes back to knowing your own decision making. If you are making the decision just to rebel and just to hurt your parents, <sighs> bug. I mean, it might hurt your parents, but don't you think it's probably going to hurt you? Even if it doesn't, 
If your life is spent in pursuit of revenge, in pursuit of evening the score, teaching them a lesson, your life is being fucking wasted. Look around at successful people, and however you define success is fine, whether that means they're in a happy marriage, the corner office, the White House, whatever. If their whole life was oriented around revenge, teaching someone a lesson, proving them wrong, they wouldn't have what they have. They wouldn't. You cannot look ahead and behind at the same time, right? Every successful person has plenty of reasons to orient their life around all of those things. We all do. You're not special. And I mean that in a positive way. We are all in this struggle together of, I'm going to overcorrect. I'm going to be a rebel. I'm going to quit this show just to teach my stupid sisters a lesson. And then, the, then they'll see. Then they'll see how much they hurt me and how much they hated me. Okay. And what does that get you, girl? What does that get you? Now, Courtney has some self-awareness. She's like, this isn't bringing me peace and I'm following my happiness. Great. But for a while, it was, I'm going to quit to fuck you over, Kim. I'm going to show you, Chloe, how crazy you're making me. I'm going to cry on camera and I'm going to storm out and I'm going to delay production. So it's very important that the decisions we're making, we're making for the right reasons, that they are truly authentic. There's no right or wrong decision. There's authentic and inauthentic. I mean, deciding to do meth is a bad decision, but it's also an inauthentic decision. You don't want meth. You probably want an absence of some sort of trauma and some sort of pain inside you. You want to get the attention of someone who you are lacking, right? Lean into that. Don't meth it out. So here are some practical ways to do this in our lives, right? Because all of this is like very esoteric. It's like, just be, be yourself. Just stand up for yourself. Standing up for yourself is just like anything else. You have to practice to be good at it. It's like playing the saxophone, giving a hand job, shaving a cat, spaying or neutering a cat even. Practice makes perfect. How do we practice standing up for ourselves? Because here's where you don't want to overcorrect. We see people like this who have been like oppressed, oppressed. We, we've been this person where it's like, I've been silent, I've been silent, I've been silent, and I do what? I explode. I freak out on someone, a boyfriend who was gaslighting me, a friend who never let me pick the place we're going to brunch, a parent who I was always making decisions based around what they wanted and what's not what's authentic to me. I get it. We can't operate in a boom and bust emotional system. It doesn't work well. It doesn't make us feel good. We feel out of control on both ends of that spectrum because you are. The, the boom is just the exact inverse of the, of the shrinking. What we want is a middle ground where we can express ourselves, still work to make people we love happy, you know, and be our best selves, but also find our true path and our true alignment and recognize that that's not going to look and feel like everyone else's. Everything I have achieved in my life, somebody told me was impossible. Or if they didn't say it was impossible, they're like, why would you want to do that? That's crazy. You don't, you don't really want to move to Montana. You don't really want to do this. You're... <laughs> You're gonna be a YouTuber? Okay. That wasn't their path. That wasn't their alignment. And I, over, it was, it was a long journey, was finally able to recognize that. It's like, this isn't your path and this isn't what you want, but it is what I want. How did I get there? Micro alignments. Micro alignments. This is a new term we're gonna use around here. If you listen to my podcast, which you should, it's called Girl on Top, it's out every week. This week, I was actually talking about this very topic, and it's funny that like Courtney Kardashian is like tied into it, but we were talking, um, I was answering a question from a girl who is having a really difficult time reconciling her parents' extremely conservative and rigid sexual beliefs, you know, no sex before marriage, or vagina is a cesspool of sin, with her own awakening, and she's like, I don't. I don't know how to live my truth and not be a disappointment to my parents, you know? And I said, micro alignments. Standing up for yourself is practice. So we have to learn what this voice inside us is actually telling us. Is the voice our intuition and our voice of alignment or is it fear and oppression and the, the Greek chorus of everyone else? Masturbation is a sin. You know, is it that? It's hard to tell sometimes. So here's how you do that. Make a ton of tiny decisions. I remember learning about eating disorders. Like I, they showed us a lot of videos about eating disorders when I was in like middle school and, and like treatment options and like videos from psychologists. I don't, I mean, I guess none of us ended up having one. So I guess it worked. 
But one thing they were saying is that if you're trying to help someone with an eating disorder, let them make as many small decisions as humanly possible. Do you want Coke or Pepsi? Are we seeing a movie at 6.45 or 9.22? Like, do you want to sit window or aisle? Are we doing this or are we doing that? So that they get a sense of power and that they can, I have a workman here, so that they can start to build their confidence from the ground up. Because if you're telling them, hey, just eat, it'll be fine, you'll be fine, just trust yourself, it's like, oh, if you're telling someone, just quit your job, who cares if your parents don't like it? Go ahead and fuck that guy. Your dad will understand later. You know, like you don't have to do this. It's too much. It's too overwhelming and it's too much because we view that as going from zero to 60 in terms of denying our tribe. And we're tribes people. We say this all the time. We're pack animals and social inclusion. Those needs are absolutely huge. So to risk getting cast out of our tribe, uh, no. So we test the waters by making those little decisions. And I said in the podcast, like, I'm raised by a single mom and I'm an only child. And so, again, we talk about the tyranny of a single parent and loving it. We're best friends. But her opinion looms very large in my life. I'm in my 30s. And it's only recently that I've been able to say, I know you don't understand, but I love you and you don't need to understand this decision. I just need you to trust me. I typically don't make really bad choices. And if this is a bad choice, I'll survive. Maybe I'll have a broken heart. Maybe I'll have $5,000 less. I'll be okay. You don't need to save me. I'm good. It's tough. When I was 22, I couldn't do that. When I was 30, I couldn't do that. It's been a very long journey. So I started on tiny things. Because like I said, if my mom's like, don't do this, I'm like, oh, oh. I started with detergent. I'm not kidding you. I've always joked that I can make a decision of what city to move to faster than I can make a de decision about like which vacuum to buy. It's like I will stand in that aisle for 30 minutes. What this? Oh my God. What about that one? And you know what I'll do eventually? I'll ask my mom and I'll just make her decide for me. And if she's not there, I'll ask my best friend or my boyfriend or someone. Like I will just farm out these decisions because I didn't trust myself. So I started small and I started with OxyClean. We're a Tide family back in California. We're a, we're a card-carrying Tide family. And the concept, I remember one time I went to Target and I bought something else and she's like, why did you buy this? I was like, hi, it's Arm and Hammer. She's like, why did you buy this? Why didn't you buy Tide? I don't like this. And I was like, oh my God. I took it back. I took it back. And I had asked myself, do I like Tide detergent? I've never particularly loved the smell of my clothes. I guess it works fine. Maybe I'll try something else. So I bought OxyClean. And I, you know what I got? Almost a panic attack. And this was a few years ago. I was like, I she's going to say something. She's going to come to my house. And she's going to see the OxyClean. She's going to say something. She's going to say something. <sighs> so I used that OxyClean. And when my mom did come to my house, and when she did see the OxyClean, and she said, "Why? oh, you don't like Tide? I, at first, I was like, no. You know what? I don't. And I'm speaking my truth. And it's full of OxyClean. And this is how I feel. And she's like, okay <laughs> just take it easy number one she didn't really care and number two i now had empirical evidence of why i preferred that over the other one or i logged evidence for oh no actually i do prefer tide okay fine then now now i'm not just going along with this rhetoric i am choosing it i choose my choice but i needed to get that real world experience with something as dumb as detergent which sounds dumb, but it's not because it had to start somewhere. And then those decisions scaled up and up and up and up until it was, no, this is the relationship that I'm in. If it crashes and burns, it crashes and burns. This is my data alone to learn. No, that's where I'm going to live. No, that hair color doesn't work for me. No, I like this. I like that. And therefore I had a sense of power. And because I had a sense of power, when my mom would offer me advice or express an opinion, I was able to evaluate it more neutrally. I was no longer overcorrecting. I could say, okay, I recognize now through my own work, first hand experience, she's right about some things, she's wrong about others. And wrong is subjective, like it's right for her, it might not be right for me. But now I have a better sense of things that are right for me. I have more data about why I make certain choices when. What was an overcorrection when I look back? Okay, the OxyClean wasn't, but cutting all my hair off maybe was. I did that in college. It was terrible. Piercing my tongue was. I didn't actually want to pierce my tongue. I just wanted to be rebellious. 
you know, you're young, whatever. It's You can take it out. It's not like I got a chest piece. It's fine. So try to practice on the micro. Then when you are moving towards larger decisions, this is what you do. You make a list of the reasons why. I'm a big list person. I love a good list. It helps me take like the jumble of thoughts and put the... <laughs> That time in a video, Shallon was trying to explain why writing was a good thing. I am the most obtuse person on the internet. That's okay. <laughs> but like, it helps me not get talked out of what I want. I'm very sort of like malleable when it comes to the people I love because I only have people in my life who I really, really admire. Like I said, if I if my mom can't pick my detergent, Becca will pick it. My boyfriend will pick it. So and so, and so I look up to people and when people are like, why are you doing that? Don't do that. I need sometimes a physical list, a list of reasons why I've decided this is okay for me. And I organize that list. I make a lot of them. I organize that list into absolutes. I know absolutely that X, Y, and Z is true. I know absolutely I don't want to live in New York City anymore. I know absolutely I don't want to live in an apartment. I think I want to live way out in the country. I think I'll like winter out here but I don't know. And so I have my fixed points, not New York, not an apartment, but the other points, there's a little wiggle room. There's a little bit of debatable room and there's room for me to change my mind. And I communicate that to people. I say, I, I know I'm completely done with New York. I'm never coming back, maybe. And I know I don't wanna live in an apartment. So you, we, can, we can rap about these other things. And that gives people less they're less likely to preach at you when they feel like they are being heard as well. But sometimes, sometimes you're just screaming into the wind. You're talking to people who are completely unreasonable. Like the girl we talked about on the podcast, her parents think she's like going to hell if she has sex before marriage. I was like, you are in hell. Hell is here. Hell is not living your life for you. Hell is living for other people and then expecting somehow to find happiness within that. That is never, ever, ever going to work. You ever see those YouTube videos where people are like, I let my four-year-old son do my makeup today. I let my boyfriend dress me for this important meeting and it's just a garbage fire. We do that as a joke because it's funny because it's so crazy to think we're going to let someone else do our makeup when they don't know. They don't know our face. They don't even know how to do makeup. That we'd let someone else dress us or control what we eat for a day or something. But yet we do that on the macro so hard. Oh, no, you're not going to do my makeup. You're going to control my love life. You're not going to pick out my outfit. You're going to pick my husband. You're going to pick my career. You're going to pick where I live. No, girl, no. And you might say, well, <laughs> my parents aren't a four-year-old. My parents are my parents and they know everything. No, they don't. They know everything they have experienced insofar in the, like the self-awareness that they've had about it, but they don't know everything about your life. They don't know everything about you. My mom and I are so close. And like, I was telling her the other day that, you know, everything that I, that made me happy in New York, like my three favorite weekends of the year, like going tubing with my friends when rodeo came to Madison Square Garden. And like, I think, what was it? I don't know, something else that was country oriented. I'm like, why did I not add up that like that means I want to be in the country? She's like, but you're a city person. I'm like, I was and part of me is and I have the right to change. And parents, we think that they like know us so completely, but they don't. We have the right to change. And sometimes change happens. And we're like, oh, my God, holy shit, who am I now? And they haven't caught up yet. Like parents are very much stuck in the past because they see us as our little as little kids and like still needing protection and they aren't on the forefront of everything we're learning and how we're growing. So standing up for ourselves is really important, not only for us, but truly for them to help them like, okay, we're on this next level now. Okay. I don't have to tell her to like look both ways as she crosses the street. Like she's got that part down. Okay. We're ascending, but it's really tough. But like I said, it's got to start on the micro. Okay. Let's recap. First of all, you got to get clear about why you're making this decision. Are you truly making this decision for you? Is this in alignment? Is this in alignment which, with what is healthiest for you or is this an overcorrection? And if it is an overcorrection, how finite 
And how controlled could the fallout be? I mean, when you say an overcorrection, is it like dad doesn't like tattoos, so I'm going to get ch like a chest piece that goes up to my neck? That's an overcorrection that has no middle ground correction, right? So instead of doing that, maybe get a tattoo on your wrist. Maybe just wear a fucking t-shirt with the design for six months and see if you still like it after all that time. Try that. But if it's like an overcorrection that can be undone, okay. What, what are you hoping to learn from it? And maybe is there a way to learn that without getting the tattoos all up your neck or moving to Montana? Then start practicing. Start practicing on the micro. Start practicing making decisions that are contrary to whatever the group, whether it's your parents, your boss, your group of friends, whoever, would necessarily find like approvable and see how that sits with you. Do it in a quiet space and don't tell other people about it. Just truly let those feelings sit and let them be heard. Then write down why you're making the decisions you're making so that you are clear about it. So you're not easily talked out of it. So that when people say something against it, you're like, no, I've actually already thought about this. I've, I've anticipated this question and I have an answer for you. But if you introduce new data points, I'm willing to log those and evaluate those. Maybe I'll agree, maybe I won't. But when we are truly clear about what we want, we're not afraid of people debating us. I know I want to be in Montana right now. I know it like I know it like I know it. And so when people are like, really? It doesn't bother me because I'm okay. But when I've made a decision that I'm not okay on, when I bought that OxyClean and it was like, why? It was like, ah, ah. I was like spiky and insane because I didn't get, I didn't feel comfortable with my decision yet. And again, that's practice. It's practice to know yourself. And it's something, again, you just have to do on the daily, listen to what bubbles up and then take that lesson into the next level of decision making. I want to know what you guys have to say about Courtney leaving the Kardashians. Are you going to miss her? Do you think the show's going to be kind of boring? Do you think that now, I don't know, Kylie's going to step up? Probably not. Is it going to be all like Kris Jenner making out with Corey Gamble? Yay. For more, click like and subscribe. I'm going to be doing a whole bunch of videos this week. And like I said, join me on Infstream for my sexy HJ tutorial. I promise you will not be disappointed. And neither will he.